Hello, everybody, and you're very welcome to this episode of In Conversation With. Today, we are joined by two guests, Professor Fiona King, who is an associate professor in the School of Inclusive and Special Education from Dublin City University, and Professor Marjorie McMahon, who is Professor of Educational Leadership and Director of the Educational Leadership and Policy Research and Teaching Group in the School of Education, University of Glasgow. Today, we're joined by two researchers with a wide ranging uh, research interest portfolio. And so just to give you a flavor of the interests of both our guests today, I thought I'd start by sharing some of Fiona's research interests. Fiona's current research interests include teacher leadership, teacher professional learning and development, collaborative practices, leadership for inclusion, as well as teacher education and self-study as a research methodology. And her recent work around social justice leadership has involved collaborations with research colleagues at various institutions across 20 plus countries within the International Social Justice Leadership Development Network. Marjorie's research focuses mainly on leadership development and career long professional learning in a range of contexts, including schools and universities. And linked to this is a focus on pedagogies for professional learning and organizational capacity building. So now I'd like to begin by chatting to Fiona a little bit about her recent research and its implications for those of us involved in educational leadership practice and educational leadership research. So Fiona, maybe you could tell us a little bit around some of your current research projects and their implications. Hey, thanks Gavin, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I suppose my research has largely been focused around uh, teacher leadership or leadership in the broadest sense in terms of leadership as influence, leadership as a social process, leadership as something that's collaborative and collective. Um, and it's it started out, I suppose, with my own doctoral studies, that's going back a long time ago now at this point, but I was looking at professional learning in the schools and I saw the huge impact that leadership had in that. So the role of leadership in developing and sustaining teachers' professional learning. I saw that that was something that you really needed to take note of, you know, in, going forward when we're looking at professional learning. And then I worked with a lot of schools in the professional development service for teachers in Ireland, and again, saw the huge impact that leadership has. Um, and leadership in that context is more kind of the principle in terms of supporting teachers and empowering them to develop collaborative cultures and, and so forth. And then moving into what was St. Pat's and now DCU at the time and working in initial teacher education, I had the wonderful opportunity of working with um, a cohort of students that engage in a specialism in inclusive and special education. So we typically had about 25 students and I had them for a module in third year on collaborative practice and a module in fourth year on leadership for inclusion. And it was new. So it was part of the first cohort of a four year B.Ed. in Ireland. And um, so this was the first time they had these modules. So I had a blank slate, which can be dangerous, <laughs> but equally invigorating and and exciting. So. For me, what I wanted out of that leadership for inclusion was that we could empower these teachers to enter the system feeling like they had a leadership role, that they could influence what happens in their classrooms and beyond, that they could work with others and ought to work with others. And I suppose I've worked on that for the last number of years. Um, and worked that when that first cohort left in 2016 and um, myself and a colleague um, have worked with a small number who elected to get involved in a community of practice to support them in enacting that leadership in schools as early career teachers because we know that that can be challenging and I suppose alongside that then at the same time I've become very involved in the leadership for professional learning network and um, so I worked with colleagues internationally. We had a symposium hosted by DCU last year. The next symposium is in Chile in 2024. Previous to that was in Cambridge in the UK and prior to that in Florida. So it's quite an international network. But again, we're looking at that leadership for professional learning. And again, it's something that's collaborative, influential. It's a practice. Mm -hmm. And 
um, I suppose finally then what I'm kind of looking at in that space is um, what has arisen out of that work is my work with Dr. Emer Holland in um, DCU, which is coming up with a professional learning, what we call a meta model to support teachers mm -hmm. to, uh, to learn how to become leaders um, as their early career teachers in the system. Um, so I think that's about that's about it, I think, Gavin. OK, great. And just before I go to Marjorie, Fiona, if I can just ask, in relation to this cultivation of collaborative practice as part of teacher formation um, or, you know, initial teacher education, is that part of the continued need, do you think, of breaking down the apprenticeship of observation whereby we often see teachers as lone rangers in a classroom and actually we still need to, despite all of the advances in the research community and probably in, in pocketed school communities, you know, around various contexts towards collaborative practice, there's still a need, is there not, to, to try and educate from the earliest stage possible of the role as teacher as being a collaborator in school communities. Absolutely. I mean, I'm particularly, I suppose, because my background is inclusive and special education. I mean, you know, one of the key sayings in that whole field is inclusion will not be won by individuals. It'll be won as part of a social learning process. It's where we work together. So in, in working with the teachers, um, I found, you know, it's such it can be such an abstract concept, collaborative, you know, collaboration and collaborative practice. And um, I really worked to kind of give them lived experiences of it. And, um, you know, so our assignments and our assessments were very much um, ensuring that they had to work collaboratively. So say for in third year, for example, I assigned them to groups because in reality, we don't get to choose who we work with in schools. We, you know, we're there to work collaboratively for the good of the students. Um, and then in fourth year, they would have worked together, but they would have chosen who to work with. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely think collaboration is something that needs to be high on the agenda. Um, we're seeing it more and more in policy. It is definitely improving in practice, um, but there's still a way to go. Right, and I think we'll talk more in a little while about this evolving uh, place of collaboration in teacher professionalism. But let's go over to Marjorie. And Marjorie, would you be able to outline for our viewers and the audience your research interests and their implications for leadership research and practice? OK, th thanks, Gavin. And, and thank you for this invitation to take part in, the, in this discussion. I love talking about leadership. Um, and I've just come from earlier today talking with a group of current head teachers who are on our in headship programme. So any opportunity to talk about leadership um, is, is very welcome. And in terms of just my current research interests, I should I, I should uh, provide a disclaimer here because I'm currently in the fourth year of a full time head of school role. So that means that I actually have, have very little time for research, although I have been able to manage to keep up with some, um, some writing and some publications. So I'm really overseeing research. However, what I did want to share with you was my journey towards where, where we ended up with this project and, and, and how um, it, it, it almost led me towards this initial teacher education emphasis. Um, and a number of years ago, I was um, we had a, a new report on teacher education that was launched in Scotland. It was 2011, so it was quite some time ago. Um, it was called Teaching Scotland's Future, but it was, really was transformative for teacher education and for school leadership uh, development. And part of uh, that, that um, uh, identified the setting up of the Scottish College for Educational Leadership. Um, and I was conned at that time by the Scottish government to lead the scoping exercise for the setting up of that college um, and how that, how that college might come into being, what it might look like and what the curriculum might look like. And allied to that was, um, uh, from the Donaldson, the Teaching Scotland's Future report was uh, the, the requirement to develop a leadership development framework. And that was about leadership at all levels. So leadership for classroom teachers, um, leadership at middle level, leadership for head teachers, but then uh, uh, the, beyond in, in the, the, the phase of qualifying as the head teacher. So, so there was lots going on on, on that space, lots of activity, um, lots of new programs, 
uh, a rewriting of the professional standards um, and, 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 and we were also reviewing our teacher education programs, both undergraduate and, and postgraduate, um, and recognizing that there is a professional continuum. And what we were trying to work with um, in, in redesigning courses and programs was to, to emphasize the professional continuum and, um, and, and try and minimize that fracture that sometimes can happen between uh, pre-service and in-service as well. So that, uh, that, that kind of led, up, led me into then looking at our initial teacher education programs because we'd, we were really spending a lot of time and energy writing about, researching um, and, and developing um, uh, different approaches to leadership development and then implementing those but, but one of the, the, the sort of the nag, nagging uh, questions that I had was, where's leadership happening in initial teacher education? Is it even there in the curriculum? Um, is it there in the standards? And, and I just felt that there was a gap. So that kind of is, is where I've ended up to uh, and in terms of, of bringing this uh, project around initial teacher education. So that's where I'm at, Gavin. <laughs> OK, good stuff. And what is it difficult, do you think, or is it something that is often just neglected, Marjorie, this kind of convergence of talking about leadership and initial teacher education. I mean, I'm sure some people think, well, no, that's for experienced teachers. Was there, were there difficulties to navigate uh, uh, during that time of, of your kind of perusing this space? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think there's there's several different dimensions to that. I mean, there is there, there is resistance, um, and, and and it's there to some extent in some of the literature as well. But 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 people. There was there was a concern that um, in beginning to advocate for uh, leadership learning in the in, in in the initial phase that you're promoting a race to the top, that it's it's actually what you're trying to do is create a pipeline, and that's not the case. It's partly partly what we need we we do need a pipeline, and we need to 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 help beginning teachers aspire to future roles as as as, as leaders in, in schools, um, but it's but it's not it's not just about that. But but I, th I think I think um, there's a distance between the initial phase and then the the the, the kind of the, the the leaders that 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 our beginning teachers will experience in school and that leadership that they will experience. So I really don't think there was a an awful lot of thought <laughs> had been given to this space. It was very much that that this is something that you do post qualification and it's in service you have to consolidate as as a beginning teacher um but i think one of the important things for me as well was that in the, in the range of different programs and courses that i've worked with i have um I, I've been aware of a number of people who are career changers for example who are coming into teaching after having maybe a significant career in in another sector in another profession having a significant experience leadership experience and actually the, the, the profession would benefit from that. So there, there, there were sort of multiple factors, but I think it was opening up that that com that conversation and, and, and getting people to think a bit more about, is there a place for leadership learning? I suppose that was the question we were asking. Is there a place, Fiona and, 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 and myself and Stephen were convinced that, that, there, that there was, but we'd, we needed to hear and engage with others around that. Okay, okay. So then maybe Fiona, you could tell us a little bit about how yourself, Marjorie and Stephen got together to kind of conceptualize the project and what the initial steps were and you know what its focus was. Yeah, so I suppose um I can't remember where we initially met, had our first conversations around this, Marjorie, but we knew that we were both interested um in looking at leadership in initial teacher education, that we had both had those conversations. And um, then the Scotons, I think, Marjorie, you brought it to my attention about the possibility of the Scotons project, which enables the cross border and um, looking at what leadership learning would look like. So we approached Stephen in uh, Northern Ireland to join us uh, on that so that we looked at then the three the three countries in terms of what leadership learning looked like in, in each of those contexts. And it, I suppose the starting point for us was to discuss what we meant by it ourselves. Picking up on something Marjorie said there a minute ago, I mean, you know, a lot of people think of it as a pipeline, as the word Marjorie said, or if we're looking at other countries and looking at the literature now, they're kind of putting it out there as an answer for, you know, kind of preventing teacher attrition mm. or, you know, supporting teacher retention. But 
that wasn't necessarily where we were in our thinking. We, we see it more than that. And um, we also, at the same time, policy in each of our jurisdictions was talking about every teacher being a leader. It's part of leadership, it's part of being professionalism. And we kind of wanted to see, well, is it that or is it more than that? So these were the kind of questions we had. And we also looked at the literature that was kind of telling us, well, teacher leadership is, you know, beyond the classroom. And we were kind of saying, well, is it beyond the classroom or can it be within the classroom? And going back to an earlier point you talked about, Gavin, and collaborative practice, classrooms years ago had, you know, one teacher and your 30 or 40 students or whatever and the door closed. Classrooms are very different now. You can have a few adults in the room. You have maybe parents coming and going for different parts of the day or support. You have support teachers coming in and out. So there is a leadership role there. So there's, you know, not only leadership of learning within your classroom, but it's leadership with the other adults. So we were kind of just trying to unpick a lot of that in terms of what is what is happening here um, and what do we mean by leadership learning? Sure. And arguably, you know, even if the individuals aren't in the classroom, you can take Anne Edwards idea about relational practitioners and there's now in response to an increasingly you know inclusive and diverse society and especially for early career and pre-service teachers there is the necessity to collaborate so that they thrive in this kind of critical period of becoming a teacher I guess so so after you kind of conceived of what do we mean by this how did you go about was it mapping the policy context and um, you talk about this notion I know Marjorie mentioned in Scotland there was this notion of leadership at all levels we probably have our own version of that here, every teacher, leader, and so on. So what were the next steps then after conceiving, I guess, of the project uh, in its execution? Do you want to take that one, Mark? Yeah, so, so the, the, there were almost two stages to that. One of the things that we wanted to do was just look at where where we were in terms of our curricula, look, looking at curriculum documents and also looking at professional standards to see where, where, where leadership learning or leadership was mentioned, referenced and, 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 and so on, and looking at, at course and program delivery. Um, so that was the first stage of it. And then the second stage was actually visiting each jurisdiction. Uh, and the three of us, three of us went, went and, and, and met with key stakeholders. So we, we visited Dublin, we visited um, the University of Ulster at Coleridge, and then had a similar session in Glasgow where we brought together different representatives and different different stakeholders. I think for me that that was the most those were the most significant conversations. They were powerful conversations um, and really rich learning for us as researchers, I would say, Fiona from it um, and, and I can think of, of, of each time we had those conversations with stakeholders, just uh, their understanding um, and, and, and their ambitions as well for, for teacher education and, and the space that teacher education could claim are, are around leadership learning. So, so it was the, the mapping exercise um, and, 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 and then, but the conversations and, and, and the focus, essentially focus groups, but, but they, they, they were really rich conversations. It's probably worth mentioning the type of stakeholders we had there. We really did have a great variety from representatives from teaching councils, you know, our, our own centre of school leadership, your equivalent in Scotland at the time was under a different name now. I can't remember what it was, um, Marjorie. Um, so I think union representatives, we had, you know, people from higher education. So we had quite, quite a diverse group. Um, and having those conversations around what leadership means, whether it belongs in um, pre-service or not, was, was very insightful. And then, of course, we spoke to pre-service students in each jurisdiction and early career teachers in a focus group as well in each of the three jurisdictions to, to get their perspectives. And so I suppose that leads me to the next question, which was what was the reception to this idea that you got from your participants? Uh, were they in favour of this and or not? And if it's one way or the other, a sense of why that might have been the case, uh, Marjorie? Yeah, I mean, I, I I think it was mixed, and and actually the the emphasis in each 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 of the three jurisdictions was different. Um, but uh, so, so I think there was an openness 
to, to, to considering it. I think that in some particularly say in the Scottish context, there was a almost a cautious welcome. Um, and that reflects just concerns that we have within within the Scottish context about the expectations that other stakeholders and wider society has around initial teacher education, where we're, we're expected to cover everything. And I think the, the caution that I was hearing from, from the, particularly our academic colleagues who participated was, we're already trying to fit so much in, in the initial phase, is this just another thing that we have to layer on? Um, and then and doing it and layering it on, actually we don't do it well and we dilute it. So for me, that was a quite 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 a, a big message that, that 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 was coming back. But that that again is just reflecting the concerns with within within the Scottish context. Um I I probably wouldn't have detected the same sort of caution in in Dublin or in in in, in Coleraine where where we met. Um but um, I I suppose one of the things that that struck me when we had the conversations uh, in, in Dublin, and particularly with those who were recently qualified as, as teachers and were so were early career teachers, um, and who had gone through the program or the course that that Fiona had spoken about, um, and and they their level of preparedness to lead was quite significant. But but what they were feeding back was that the system just wasn't as ready for them. So there's there's a, a there's a mismatch. There, there were confident uh, uh, practitioners who who had those highly developed collaborative skills and leadership skills, but actually there was a risk that they were going to run into confrontation with the system that just wasn't ready for them. Okay. Okay. So I mean, in one way, you're talking about a squeezed initial teacher education curriculum. Mm. Maybe people like Fiona kind of seizing that opportunity to develop somewhere within the curriculum, the mindset and the disposition, and then we hit system cultural barriers. Fiona, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on that maybe? Yeah, I suppose we were fortunate enough in DCU that we have these capstone modules on our specialisms, which are leadership. So it that gave me the space to be able to, to run with it. And so I had the opportunity to work with, with the pre-service teachers in doing that. And I was so conscious that, and I remember even like, you know, talking to them at the end of fourth year, they were so fired up. They were so committed to the moral purpose of inclusion and special education. And they were going to go out and exercise their leadership and nothing was going to stop them. And I really had to be careful that I wasn't setting them up to fail that I wasn't setting them up for a big fall because they were going to have to deal with the reality of being a newly qualified teacher and all that goes with that. Um, and also then um, maybe being met with resistance or maybe, you know, going out into a system that's still largely hierarchical, that you wait your time, you bide your time before you can become a leader, even though they didn't conceptualize leadership as that. But leadership still requires opening your mouth and saying what you think or that kind of little maybe stepping up or pushing back when something doesn't align with your moral values or the way you see things should go so it's it's equipping them with the skills for that I suppose where we saw the system wasn't ready was there was no expectation that these young people coming out would have expertise or would have and um, the skills or they were just never asked it was never considered so I suppose there's a body of work to be done the other side of it in terms of working with leaders to say look we have all these wonderful teachers coming out that have the skills the leadership skills in lots of different areas so um so that was one of the I suppose the big findings that we that we found and also, I suppose, just going back to Marjorie's earlier point where we talked about how do you fit it in? We had an explicit module on leadership, OK, leadership for inclusion. But in some of the other jurisdictions there, it was more implicit. So and having explored it with everybody and with the students, we kind of came up with that you need both. You need kind of like an explicit focus and an implicit. So it's the balance of getting both at initial teacher education level that will equip them with the skills to be able to 
go out and exercise that leadership. Yeah, I suppose you can do that in many different ways, like the, you know, searching for the values, reflecting on your values. Probably there's scope for it to some degree in educating future teachers on research informed practice or evidence informed approaches to your work, uh, particularly in a system like our own in school self evaluation where they're going to work in teams with other teachers to look at how do we lead on school improvement, what matters to us and how do we achieve that. Are there other ways maybe that it can be achieved as well, Marjorie, based on the research you conducted? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think probably one of the things we, we could do more work around is the student practicum as well. And those partnerships that we have with with placement and, and uh, schools that, that we work with for, for students who are undertaking their, their, their field experiences. And I think the, the whole mentoring system around that is something that we could just utilize much more um, effectively. The, the other thing I was, I was just going to uh, elaborate on that, that, that Fiona had mentioned was that in, in each of the three jurisdictions that we were looking at, there were three different approaches. So Fiona had these was able to progress it through the capstone projects. It was more implicit um, and embedded within the curriculum in, in, in the experience that we heard about at Ulster University. And for us at, at Glasgow University, um, it was really an add-on. It was an elective. So it, it, and, and actually that took a lot of effort to try and get that into the curriculum. And so I suppose that the, 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 the end, as you said, yet yeah, there are different approaches to doing this. But but also I think I think there needs to be big questions asked about how how do we do it how can we actually make it so that it, it is embedded but that all students have an experience of it that all students are are, are actually engaged in that dialogue and, and and that conversation um around their role as leadership and their 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 contribution to leadership and I suppose that was one of my concerns as we got through worked through the project and got to the end of it as well is that this is this is about um, helping students as, as professionals in practice develop the collaborative and leadership skills they will need, but also to help them better understand the leadership that they will experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, and I think that's a really important part of it because sometimes going in as a, an early career teacher, as Fiona has already alluded to, schools remain quite hierarchical and the culture and the context is something that I think sometimes it can be very hard for new teachers to begin to understand where does power reside? Where does the decision making reside what's their role in contributing to that and I, th I think that that learning about leadership has got to be about learning about the leadership that they will experience and can potentially contribute to and so bringing it right back to, to my response to your question there I think that that practicum and that mentoring role is is also really important there and the, the, the importance of of a mentor who can who, who, who can navigate and model that for beginning teachers and and, and, and student teachers that's probably particularly relevant given, you know, some of the, well, some of the issues connected to distributed leadership often talk about asymmetries of power. Yeah. And perhaps having that mentor to help you navigate that is something that's really crucial, but also probably demands of us to examine our beliefs, particularly at senior leadership level, around feedback cultures and open feedback and communication cultures in schools. Um, I'm just wondering, Fiona, if you have anything else to add in there about, uh, you know, other ways maybe we can achieve this. Yeah, just as I was listening to Marjorie talking there, um, two things came to mind. One is part of what we worked with with the teachers was aligning it with what you mentioned earlier, Gavin, something like school self-evaluation. So we were working with the teachers for them to kind of be able to explore opportunities of how they what they wanted to do could align with what was happening in the school so that it would tick a box for the other teacher that they wanted to work with or it would tick a box for the principal in terms of oh yeah well that's part of our school self-evaluation yeah yeah we can support that we can do that or whatever so it was literally teaching them how to make a sales pitch for what they wanted to do or what stakeholder has the power here or who has an interest in that or who might support me so we literally identified those in in their school context in terms of how they could forward that um i suppose attempt to exercise leadership in their schools now we did that as i say with a small community of practice of seven teachers um following when they left and we've done that for the last few years but i mean gosh 
those teachers have gone on and done wonderful things from writing a joint article, making, you know, conference presentations um, at different uh, conferences, including Failture, which is our teaching council celebration of teaching and learning. Um, and they really have been committed to that. But what they said were, because obviously they're all in different schools, but what they said were coming together in the community was they had the common focus. They had the moral purpose of the inclusion and they had people who were like minded, regardless of what was happening in their school. Mm -hmm. So actually, what has been interesting in that research is that they're exercising leadership within their classrooms very comfortably. They're exercising it quite comfortably at nearly at system level or with other schools. But the last place they're exercising it is within their own school because they haven't got that either credibility yet or the license or um, the space. Some have been able to navigate it a little bit better. But as we know, a lot depends on the culture of the school within which you're working. So, um, so that can determine a lot. And I suppose the last thing I suppose I want to say that struck me from the focus groups that we did that time is, and I remember we talked about it at the time where we said, these are a generation Z teachers coming out. And by gosh, do they want to lead and expect to lead. And, you know, most people go into teaching to make a difference, but they really want to do that. And I think if, if that space is not created for them, you know, I would have concerns down the road, but thankfully we seem to be moving away from the hierarchical system, albeit slowly, I think we're making small steps in that space. So this may be, you know, in my mind at least, this tells me to some degree that we have this emerging, and I know there's people who look at generation, generational approaches to leadership like Karen Edge and people, but here if we think about taking the leadership into initial, taking leadership into initial teacher ed, we're talking about a new almost professional identity and sense of professionalism. Is that a, a sense you took away from this as well, Marjorie, based on the research? Yeah, and uh, we had some debates around around this. Is that is what we're actually talking about? Just professionalism, <laughs> um, and 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 actually, I think I think we can reach the conclusion it was, but it was more than that. Actually, that 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 that, that and and leadership is you know something that is a, a, a quality and a set of experience and behaviours that that we think should be there and visible in in professional standards and and, and written into. Uh, to, to, to programs of initial teacher education as well, and and linked to the, just the, just what we've been hearing from from Fiona there about that this hunger that, that that is there to be able to lead and, and, and this wish to lead. I think I think part of it, what, what we find as well was that we really do need to challenge notions around positional leadership. And, and so we've still got the hierarchical structures, but we've also got uh, sort of deeply embedded notions about who who should exercise leadership in what roles and what posts and i think we still got a lot of work to do around that around the distributive uh, approaches the shared leadership the collaborative leadership so I, I would i mean i don't think we can make the distinctions between collaboration and leadership i think the two interact and and and, and are complementary um but but we just it is about cultures and contexts as well mm -hmm. Lots of benefits, I think, to be derived from this, too, in a climate increasingly where there are challenges with maybe retention of teachers or even recruitment of teachers. Fiona, do you agree that maybe embedding leadership more prominently in initial teacher education offers us some solutions to some of those issues and maybe other more sustaining factors of being a teacher? I certainly think it has the scope to do that. Um, but. As Marjorie said earlier, it's not the sole purpose of it. Um, I do, and increasingly in the literature, we are seeing that teacher leadership can be the answer for um, retention and recruitment. And I suppose we're privileged in the Irish context that we haven't experienced much of those issues to date. We're starting to maybe experience a little bit around the recruitment, but not so much around the retention yet. Whereas internationally it's a huge issue um, 
and teacher leadership has kind of been put up there as maybe a way to to keep people in the profession so i would i would say yes it could do that but i would i would be cautious about it as well because you know if we're looking at leadership as influence and we're looking at it as something that's collaborative and it's a social process and it's based around a moral purpose or a common interest you know these teachers want to be involved in it not because it's a position or a role that may come but that's not their their purpose and their aim in it so i wouldn't like it to get muddied the way arguably distributed leadership has been muddied over the years whereas you know what jim spillan envisaged as distributed leadership we see in a lot of cases has turned out to be something that's more delegated and um you know not the shared interaction that it was envisaged as yes or or you know uh, poorly conceptualized work intensification and expansion yes. <laughs> which is is not desirable at all yeah. um maybe then if we look to the future um uh in terms of future research in the space of initial teacher education and leadership and our educational leadership more broadly because i think it's fair to say some might have thought about bringing these terms together was a bit of a blue sky idea. So I'd like to ask you both now, you know, where to next for, for these two areas? Marjorie, maybe beginning with yourself. So uh, where, where to next? Well, I suppose, uh, Gavin, I'm still on a campaign <laughs> um, because I really do think that that we need to continue to advocate for leadership learning and initial teacher education with all of the caveats that, that Fiona and I have shared. I, I, I think that the future of, of, of the teaching profession um, requires this. And and I think I think Fiona also mentioned about this the the generation of teachers that we were connecting with or the generation Z, but they're also the generation that's been through a pandemic, and and that and those teachers have had to lead in a in a completely different way, and I think that has been transformative for them. And, and I think even if it wasn't explicit, I think many many teachers. At, at, at all stages of their careers have, have been required to lead in, a, in a, such a variety of ways and in, in, in how they've responded to the pandemic. So I, th I think there's there's so much um, that we can build on from that. But where does where to next? And this links not just for um, post-qualifying um, uh, teacher education and, and leadership development. It's also about the initial phase as well. Um, um, and one of the things I think is around the whole area of ethical leadership and the ethical dimensions of, of being a, a, of a teacher uh, and, and a professional um, and advocacy leadership. Um, and I, I've recently just returned from, from, from um, America where we've been looking at some um, institutions where that's the direction of travel for them, that they're really seeing that it's 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 not just about the curriculum and the how to teach and the pedagogy, but it's also thinking about those roles in terms of that moral purpose that 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 Fiona really started her conversation with with today. So so that's the the direction that I that I would um, want want us to to really focus in on. And the second thing to say is, is 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 and you mentioned this at the beginning is about the future of teacher education and leadership development and 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 also the the role that we have in preparing the next generation. Um, of, of teacher educators and leader leadership educators as well yeah often that's left to chance isn't it yeah. Marjorie with people who've reached perhaps a pivot point in their career the end of their career and they kind of get brought in and the precarity of mm -hmm. not paying attention to this is a very serious uh, exercise in sustaining our educators yeah, absolutely. And so, and I, and I think we need to formalize it a bit more and professionalize it a, a bit more in terms of the systems and the processes and and the recruitment the recruitment to it. Mm -hmm. Fiona, yourself, look into the future. I agree with Marjorie. The work is not done in initial teacher education, and I I, I wouldn't like to think that that's safe there at all because I think as you know as things evolve things get squeezed. So there's always going to be the issue of where do we fit it, regardless of whether it's explicit or implicit. Um, so I do think that conversation needs to be on the table at initial teacher education level, and we need to make sure it's kept there. Um, but the other place is at system level. So I, I think we need to be getting to the principals and kind of exploring their um, 
idea of, you know, what to expect from teachers and um, newly qualified teachers and whether leadership is part of that remit or not. Um, I mean, I see it at another level. So and that's why I would be keen for principals to have a focus of research on this is um, as part of some of the work I do in DCU, we work with postgraduate teachers who come in to do a course for, um, it's a year long postgraduate course and they're existing teachers working in the area of inclusive and special education. And there's a module in there on collaboration and leadership because it's central to inclusion. And, um, you know, we're all the time talking about the same thing there in terms of, you know, the leadership skills now, when you go back, you'll be able to collaborate and, you know, kind of focusing on enhancing that capacity of others back in school that, you know, we're moving away from seeing professional learning as something that's individual, you know, or human capital that we need to be focusing on whole schools and social capital. And, and again, I'm kind of seeing there, um, anecdotally that a lot of the principals the expectation is not there that these teachers would lead when they go back you know even though they now have a postgraduate so I think you know the experience of um, inclusive and special education and leadership within that so I think it's a broader issue in terms of exploring it with the principals in terms of leadership more generally and and um, I know it's Mel Ainscow, you know, who's one of the leading researchers in the area of inclusion, always says that a lot of the experience and the skills are actually within our schools. But we just need to get better at moving it around. <laughs> we need to get better at knowing what everybody's good at and ex having opportunities for exercising that leadership within our schools. So for me, it's both looking at ITE and and the principles and keeping the focus there. Thanks Fiona, lots, lots of food for thought there and that dual focus for sure. Now I know before we go, it's uh, time to just make sure that there's nothing else to add because oftentimes in a, in a conversation like this, thoughts crop up and the questions don't come up. So just before we go, anything else to add based on our discussion today before we, we close? I suppose I, I, as somebody who's done work on professional standards, I, I, mean, I think we have to think about uh, we can we can try and, and promote this sort of thing through our curriculum uh, within initial teacher education. But the standards, the professional standards are also an important lever here. Um, and, and I think conversations around um, you know, how, how we could develop the professional standards to reflect that leadership learning opportunities and, and, and the application and practice would be would be good to, in the, as we review professional standards on a cyclical basis. Mm -hmm. And they're obviously something that in terms of ethical practice in the US, in terms of the PSEL standards, professional standards for education and leadership, we can bring in these more nuanced ideas into standards. They don't always have to be about the technicalities of practice. Yeah. And that offers us a good pathway forward, I think, for reflecting on how we might bring the less technical aspects of leadership into the more uh, initial teacher education mm -hmm. phase. Yeah. All that remains then for me to do is to thank you both. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you very much, Marjorie, for taking the time today. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you both. Thank Thanks, you, Gavin. Thanks.